isn't it of a likelihood, I can't measure all of this, uh, that uh, because of the movement being not ideologically or scientifically based, it can be easily influenced by corporate or state actors. Thank you. Um, first of all, we have to, I think we have to recognize that there never have been movements that were ideologically or scientifically based. They never existed. So the Marxist movements claimed to be ideologically and scientifically based, but there was no science and there was no ideology. Uh, this was just a mask for authoritarianism. So what was the science or ideology in the Marxist movement, for example? I don't think you can find it. You can find a lot of uh, pretension, and there's a whole intellectual tradition of uh, trying to discuss the science and so on, but uh, no, it's just not there. And the ideology basically did, was mostly a kind of follow me. There was not much in the way of ideology. Uh, the contemporary movements, I think, are much sounder in this respect. They're much more resilient. Uh, they don't have uh, false beliefs in uh, uh, non-existent ideologies or fake science. Uh, but they are committed to... You know, they vary so much you can't generalize about them. But many of them are committed to very serious work on real issues. Can, does that make them susceptible to control by... Uh, Centralized power, yeah. I mean, centralized power is not giving it up easily. They're going to fight back by every means they have. And there are many means. Uh, the uh, you know, uh, marginalizing people through uh, uh, directing them to consumption is a major means of control. And we shouldn't underestimate how extreme it is. So in, in the United States, the United States is the most advanced country in this respect because it's the most free country. I mean, it's a credit to the American people that they're the most propagandized. Uh, the efforts to control them are, have to be much more extreme because there's so few ways to coerce people thanks to previous triumphs. Uh, but advertising in the United States, you just, you really have to I mean, it amazes you when you study how it works. I've been interested in it. For example, there's a field of applied psychology, academic applied psychology, a major field of academic applied psychology, which is concerned with uh, nagging by children. I don't know how you translate that into Hungarian. There's some, well, which, when children bother their parents to get them to do something, you know, it's called nagging. Everybody who has uh, taken care of children knows about it. Uh, there's a field devoted to nagging, and there's a logic behind it. Uh, the corporations had been concerned for a long time about the fact that there is a big part of the population which could uh, purchase things but doesn't have any money. Children. Okay. So the big mass of people who are children who you could somehow you know, coerce into, by advertising into buying things, but they don't have any money, so they can't do it. Well, brilliant thought came to someone. Uh, the way to do it is to get them to nag their parents. Uh, so now uh, they've de discovered you know, half a dozen different kinds of nagging, and advertising for children is carefully designed and controlled to elicit the kind of nagging that might get the child to buy, get their parent to buy this particular good. And so they're not called children. They're called evolving consumers. So the question is how you get evolving consumers to torture their parents into buying something that just to shut them up. I mean, I can see how it works with my own grandchildren. You know, they see something on television and you know, the huge propaganda to make them think they've got a habit or their life comes to an end. And if it turns out to cost $800, it's not a second thought, you know, what's money? Your parents or grandparents have infinite amounts of it. Uh, so they uh, you nag them to get that. Well, you know, th these are techniques of control. And they start from infancy. 
I mean, if you watch, you know, sometimes watch television with my grandchildren from infancy, they are deluged with propaganda, uh, which is aimed at making them perceive them their own identity in terms of the number of goods that they have. There's nothing in your life except the goods that you have. Actually, if you watch American television programs, uh, these have a very destructive effect in much of the world, especially in the, in the third world, but even in Europe. I mean, American television programs, you know, comedies and so on, they give a picture of life, which is designed, of course, to be like that. It's a picture of life in which nobody works, nobody has a job, uh, nobody has problems, the only kind of pro nobody's in jail, you know, and nobody's poor, uh, everybody's got everything you can imagine. The only problems you have are you're having a problem with your girlfriend or something like that. That's life, you know. Well, you know, there are plenty of people who are seduced by that vision of life. I mean, you get people all over the world who say, well, you know, why can't I live like that? I have to work and you know, I have all these problems and so on. But there in that marvelous country, they don't have any of those things. Well, you know, the relation to reality, you don't have to bother talking about. Uh, but it is a seductive picture, and it affects uh, children, it affects people elsewhere in the world. It, uh, it's a technique of control, very carefully contrived. I mean, a huge amount of effort goes into this. The, are the popular movements uh, uh, subjected to it? Sure they are. I mean, they're subjected to enormous propaganda uh, to make you feel that your own individual what are called rights, which usually means right to consumption, uh, is uh, supreme, and nothing else exists. I mean, there are plenty of people within the popular movements who are caught up in the efforts to uh, destroy any uh, social organization within the society, like, say, schools. You know, public schools are uh, a social commitment so public schools are based on, on the idea of solidarity. Right? Public schools are based on the idea that you're supposed to care whether some child somewhere else can go to school. Well, you have driven into your head day after day that you're only supposed to care about yourself. You know, it's none of your business if that kid across the street doesn't go to school. It's his problem or his parents' problem. But you have no reason to pay taxes so that somebody else can do something, that's the government stealing money from you. You know, that's presented as the government stealing your hard-earned money to give away to somebody. And why should you agree to that? I mean, the amount of propaganda behind that is enormous. Uh, and it affects people all over the place. And there are other techniques of control. So, for example, since the 1960s, there's been a lot of concern about controlling young people, students, because of student activism. Well, one of the best ways to control people is to drive them into debt. Uh, so now, as distinct from the 1960s, uh, when a student comes out of college, she's often deeply in debt. Uh, Tony Blair knows exactly what he's doing when he's increasing tuition, demanding a tuition increase in the uh, British universities. That's not for economic reasons. I mean, you get way more than that by making corporations pay taxes instead of Flee, you know. But it is a way of coercing students. I mean, if students have to pay tuition to get into school, for one thing, it has the obvious class effect. You know, it keeps out the poorer students. But the other thing even, is, even for those who get in, they're going to end up college with a big debt burden. So suppose you graduate as a lawyer, let's say, and you decide you want to work on public interest law, you know, or environmental law or something. But you come out with a huge debt. Well, you know, the only way to deal with it is to go to work for a corporation and become a corporate lawyer. And pretty soon you get trapped into that and then you can't get away from it. Uh, those are techniques of coercion that constantly work. So sure, you know, there's every, uh, uh, everything from that to, you know, the Iraqis are going to come and kill us uh, is a way of coercing people. Uh, and, uh, I mean, in the United States, for example, uh, if you look at the economy of the last 25 years, just the internal economy, it's a very unusual period in American economic history, in fact unique. It's the first time, aside from 
major depression, uh, that there has been stagnant uh, real incomes. So for about 90% of the population in the United States, and this, this is pretty much true in England too, uh, real incomes, you know, the amount of actual money that you have to buy things, is either stagnant or declining. It's about 90%. Also, work hours are going up. So people work much harder. Uh, and they're much more insecure. Uh, that's a crucial part of the economy, is, and it's conscious, is to make people insecure. Uh, there's a name for it in the uh, economics literature. It's called le flexibility of labor. And if you take an economics course, they teach you that's a good thing. You should have flexible labor markets. The flexible labor markets is a phrase that means when you go to sleep at night, you don't have to have a job the next morning. And that's good for the economy, uh, because if you're insecure, you're not going to try to get higher wages, and you're not going to join a union, and you're not going to do all those terrible things, uh, and you're not going to ask for benefits, and that's healthy for the economy. And there's a way to say it in academic graduate school prose, and there's a way to say it in simple words, but that's what it comes down to. Well, these are all techniques of control. Are people subject to them? You can't help it. Will they uh, break up the social movements? That depends on the commitment of the people who are in them. Meaning, first of all, you have to become aware of all of these things, which is not so simple, uh, and then you have to be willing to struggle against them and to create alternatives. You know, but that's what social struggle is about.